I had not visited. I had done something by bus. So when you arrive in a bus, you can walk maybe half a mile, two miles, you know. But uh, uh, there is places you can go by bus, like the Grand Canyon. So I had gone there, obviously. I had gone to all the national park because you can go there with public transportation. But in many of the places where I shot, the only way I could go there is basically not to be off the road, but taking the road, you know. Therefore, spending something like three hours to go and shoot one shot, mm -hmm. you know. So the, to, to have the sense of where to figure out places which will have no uh, artifacts made by man, no background footage, which because obviously that's 16 meter is done with an IFLEX camera with only one assistant and one car. And I, uh, you know, invited my brother to cook for us over the summer because I really could not afford more than one salary, you know. So I, uh, basically we, we could walk and we could, uh, with the equipment and that's it. There was no effect budget at that time, you know. <laughs> no place to Photoshop anything in the background. So he had to be, he had to be on my trip. Yeah. So I did a huge amount of work, maybe a, a year before shooting. When I was shooting this, the cold die, the film I did before, I prepare uh, with map where I could go. You yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, so I was pretty organized, but I spent. Uh, because these long days in the summer that was very efficient. I shot about 40, you know, about two hours of footage over the summer. And the fall was very efficient because I had a much better assistant who really knew the land. Mm. So that was helpful. And uh, so I changed my crew also. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had New Yorker at first and I had yeah. Western mm -hmm. <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Live and learn, yeah. What was so striking to me, all the film I had done before involved people, and people make you, give you pleasure when you shoot them because they laugh, because mm -hmm. they do things which are unpredictable. And actually, shooting the land is very hard because there's, you know, you, you only fail basically <laughs> in many ways. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because you are too late or something like that. Sometimes right. you have some surprise, but most of the time it's very hard work. And, and the editing was so much more uh, lengthy because of it. Right. Yeah. So I collected, when I was shooting, I was taking newspaper, which, uh, you know, free newspaper uh, with publicity, with weather condition, which you find when you buy your gas and mm -hmm. so on, or the food you are going to cook uh, on the trail, you know. I was camping over the summer, in the fall I was camping, and uh, in the winter I had to go to a hotel, obviously it was too cold to stay mm. outside. Uh, and the spring is the same thing, I was camping again. But I collected material which was useful later on to retrace, and I also mm. uh, marked the condition of the shoot, the temperature, right. and so on and so on. Because I kind of knew then to give life to the footage, I needed to specify what you don't photograph really. Is, is mm -hmm. it cold, is it warm, is it this, right. is it is that? And uh, you know, it's like being homeless basically, mm -hmm. uh, camping and, and doing uh, the work. Yeah. It's like you, you lose your baby, you lose your sense. Mm -hmm. So at, at least there I could identify with people who spent four months on the trail. I right. really felt uh -huh. I had something to contribute <laughs> there because I was not four months. But, I, you know, you expose yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I felt that was very important in the film. Oh, it, the film was shaped by the shoot right. in many ways. Yeah. I had no concept that I would finish the film like that. Yeah. Right. Um, that sort of leads to my next question, which... I, I took a look at the Nature and Culture, the book that you cite at the end, and there's a chapter on clouds. And um, I learned there that uh, Constable uh, made notes, like meteorological notes, on the back of his cloud study. So it would be like the date, the direction, the weather, and the aspect. And there was a quote that I thought was nice. 
Fresh and bright between showers, much the look of rain all morning, but very fine, and grand all afternoon and evening. Mm -hmm. And this, this made me think of your film. Um, and I was curious if Constable was an influence. I hate Constable, you know, I'm a total Turner fan. And each time I'm in London, which I try to be as often as I can, uh, because I like Tate Britain, and I go and see the Turner. I mean, for me, it's like what go, you know, I spend like five minutes today. There's a beautiful room of what go in the museum. Now as part of their, uh, you know, exposition on their permanent collection. And uh, it's the same thing. I mean, I turn a, you know, constable in a way, he, he photograph what is there. Mm. He, he, he paint what is there. I try to paint what is there just now, but it's going to disappear, you know? Right. I'm, I'm like a still photographer with a movie camera who try to keep trace of what is going to disappear. That's what I wanted to do in my film. I wanted to do the opposite of Ansel Adams, the opposite of the right. static in landscape. And I was really, really conscious, and I love painting. And basically, I'm a filmmaker because I love looking at painting when I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. I was totally amazed. Uh, I think I was 12 or 13, and I saw a series of Claude Monet painting of the Westminster Abbey and also the Reims Cathedral which are uh, two huge rooms, bigger than this auditorium, you know, full of uh, a cathedral in Reims, which is a famous Gothic, uh, the city which do the champagne, the champagne, but also the city which uh, crowned uh, the king in France in the past. And, uh, and also he did, uh, uh, Claude Monet did a series of uh, view, of different view in London, a different time of the day, and, and what you have when you see those, uh, those kind of variation on, uh, on, uh, on shapes, but uh, the variation is in the color and in the implication of the time of day and so on, it's that sense of uh, a movement in the landscape. And I think I felt that painting could represent something which was passing by, mm -hmm. you know. Later on, I became a filmmaker because what is passing by is what interests me the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you no know, movement. So obviously, uh, that really was uh, the impetus. So constable, no. Yeah. But the idea then, if you don't, you know, if I don't give information which are going to. So when the film was first shown, people hated it. You know, because they, I mean, they love the picture. They say it's so beautiful. Why do people have to talk? You know? <laughs> I, I think now it's ridiculous, you know, I think the, the speech is, I mean, obviously the image is interesting to see, but what is said is also interesting to hear, you mm -hmm. know, so at least I hope that you're going to agree with me, but right. I, I'm, I'm convinced. Right. right. That was my intention, and I hope it's communicated well, yeah. including at the time it was harder to... At the time when the film was made, it was harder to convince people of that. They wanted mm -hmm. to have just visual pleasure, you know. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to think. Right. And for me, uh, in a way, I want to make film which not just make the audience think, but at least uh, uh, make them retroactively, uh, you know, think. Right. In their memory of the film, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about panning and cutting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you pan, a mat, like the horizon becomes a moving line. When you cut quickly, it introduces speed and tempo. And I was just very interested by your choices there. Yes. You know, I kind of... Uh, I, I had reflected on how you shoot landscape and basically you, you, you have no way to, to look at, at this. You have no way to understand the scale of what you're looking mm -hmm. at if you don't have a human figure. And I did not realize that uh, really until I had finished the summer. 
And that's the reason in the fall I uh, really shot two people coming in when I speak mm -hmm. of Lincoln. Uh, you know, the first national park is Yosemite in California. Many of you must have gone to Yosemite. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, it was important because suddenly that tree, which is enormous, you know, mm -hmm. but I knew it was enormous because I, had, I was there and I know the size of what I see. And for many of you who know Yosemite, you, you also know when you see the El Capitan or whatever. But, uh, you know, in many other places you don't know. So I, I thought it was kind of important at some point to bring a human figure to give us a sense of the space. But the other thing which could give me the sense of the space is actually the voice narrating something and mm -hmm. giving a kind of echo of, uh, or uh, changing for something which is totally abstracted to something which is extremely representational. So mm -hmm. in the editing, I mm -hmm. could do that. Mm -hmm. Not the really giving a sense of the the size of what I was looking at, a mud right. hill or a mountain, but giving you the sense of the the, the difference mm -hmm. of vision mm -hmm. than the camera uh, strategy implies. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. I am in my film. I'm not, you know, as pristine as in the film I do as a camera person. I mean, I'm the opposite of what mm -hmm. I did. Uh, with great uh, pleasure, I must say, in the film mm -hmm. of Chantal Ackerman, or uh, Ivan uh, Rainer, or Sally Porter, or whatever, you know, which is much more uh, straight mm -hmm. in terms of uh, more, not necessarily conventional, but uh, more uh, pristine, in a way. I'm pretty right. sloppy in my own camera work, mm -hmm. because after all, <laughs> my, my stuff. Right. I don't have to prove myself. <laughs> Um, I guess maybe one more question, then I definitely would like to open it up to the audience. Um, I'd be curious, did making this film and the two other landscape films you made, did that feel very different from the other work you were doing at the time? Or? Yeah, extremely different. Now, uh, the first film there were, is that film I described briefly, I did in 79, when I learned to drive. And I was in San Diego at UCSD, where I'm currently teaching, and there I was just for three months. And uh, I tested the idea, and it mm -hmm. was to do a year later, the Scar location. Uh, but the film I did, I did after, the third film, is very, very different. Mm -hmm. It's about real estate, it's called Visible City, it's 31 minutes, and it's about what I, uh, I felt the need to do that film because I was coming at UCSD to teach permanently, and I said, oh my God, I'm a New Yorker. I don't want to be in California. I hate to drive, I hate mm -hmm. this, I hate that. I have to figure out my back, uh, my, uh, the territory I'm going to have to invest in. So I did that film. I, I, I want to pay an homage here to uh, Jean-Pierre Gorin, with whom I had worked in the interim and uh, who was a colleague of mine in San Diego, and he told me, you have to explore your own backyard. And I know you, some of you could see Manny Farber's show, which closed last week, and uh, was somebody I, I love dearly, and uh, who got me at UCSD for the mm -hmm. in the first place. And, um, and that was an idea coming from his uh, understanding of what mm -hmm. film is doing. You know, you are looking at the environment, the, the, the commonality of, uh, and the domesticity of you little world to actually mm -hmm. spawn on something which can communicate to a larger, a larger audience, basically. Term it out, basically. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, the third film is very much, uh, not an homage of money, but uh, 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 something which is coming from exploring a landscape in which I'm going to have to live. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have questions from the audience. Love to hear from you. Hi, Babette. I studied with you 30 years ago at UC San Diego. Linda Todich, and I'm really happy to see you. But um, I have a question Linda? of... Linda, yes. My God, I have to <laughs> <her> again. <laughs> My God. That's 
good. Hi, I just, I just don't want to. Last time we saw each other, we had the new art. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Anyway, <laughs> I just didn't want to start talking. With yeah, yeah. Me. Okay, so I have a question about the music in the film. Um, uh -huh. Not the music that was composed, but the music that was selected. It seemed like it, sometimes it was the fourth voice, you know, of the, on the soundtrack. And so yeah, I, I, yeah, I decide on the Brahms, and I decide on the La Song. And Anne, who was a PhD student in music at UCSD, uh, at the time, I, uh, I like uh, the music. She had invented the computer instrument. But in my film, I wanted to have just real instruments, so she used, uh, she used real uh, acoustical instruments. But it was very influenced by the two original uh, pieces which uh, I decided to use because one of them corresponded to the kind of, uh, uh, in a way, majesty of the, of, the, of the American West landscape. And the last song is because I love Strauss. You know, it's very conventional, but on the other hand, I think those last songs are just an amazing uh, musically, so I don't know. Yeah. But you so what used... was your question about the music? Okay, the, the, the one piece of music you used, you used it twice. And so that's why I'm really curious about it. Onward Christian Soldiers. Two different musicians. One of them was just with a little portable organ, and the second one was an orchestration that went into an abstraction work. And I was wondering if that, you know, was a hymn maybe you were thinking that might have been sung by the pioneers as they were going across the West? At all? Do you remember? No, I, I use bits and pieces of a soundtrack from Western because originally I wanted to visit the, the West because I love John Ford uh, Western. You know, so uh, there, there is bits and pieces of, uh, you know, the cavalry marching on and this kind of thing, but those are kind of uh, narrative sound which is not really part of the musical track, yeah. So, the, the, you know, I pretty much never use music. Uh, but here that was important, and in the last film I did on landscape, which is called Visible City, uh, which, went, uh, which was done at the beginning uh, of me uh, uh, in 89, 90, 91. That's when I shot the movie. I finished it in 91. Uh, I use a musician too, which was also the sound recordist of the voice, which was recorded. There was two women's voice, which was recorded in the outdoors location where I shot. So I use the music is a bit different because, but I use Lully, you know, which is a French musician from Louis XIV time, at some point. So. Uh, in a way, for the same reason, because of a connotation of, uh, of uh, wealth and pomp and uh, pompousity and, you know, malehood, which goes with the architecture I was uh, joking about in Visible City, yeah. So I use it as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, in the stereotypical, uh, I mean, as a way to be, to be uh, uh, satirical with the material in the case of Visible City, in the case of, you know, I, I cannot be critical of my film in a way. I, I am unable to have a distance toward them, especially when they are very old, <laughs> because I forgot. I have forgot uh, what I did not succeed in, you know. When you finish a film, you suddenly realize, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that should not have been there, and so on. So you start, you hate your film, and you go on to do another one, you know. Uh, but now, those have been done so long ago, I'm kind of accepting the failure. <laughs> I think it's probably worse now, yeah. But it's interesting, there was, uh, you know, I went to places which had been photographed by some of the survey photographers uh, of the 1870, 1880. 
And there was a, a study made by a photographer, I think, from uh, Chicago, who went back there 100 years later and saw then certain places that totally were exactly the same and others were totally transformed. So it's kind of interesting because most of the places which were out of the way and were picturesque enough to interest a photographer are not this to have changed that much. They're just too far away. You know, it's too long to get there. And if you cross Nevada, there is nothing there because everything belongs to the, to the federal government and everything is out of bounds. You can't even uh, uh, park there and camp there, you know. So uh, it's kind of, a, I went back to show that land and I had photographed in between 80 and 81, you know. And I went back to show it to my nephew. I went back because I was crossing uh, with my car from New York to San Diego uh, on and off uh, uh, all through the 90s. I was still taking my car back and forth, uh, you know, uh, when I was going on a break and so on. Now I don't do that. I take planes. But I, I, if anything has changed, it's more polluted and the water is not good to drink. And that's, and, you know, and there's less and less water too, so it's drier. So I think there is definitely an effect. And, um, you know, at that time I was already thinking global warming, although the term did not really exist, but the, the you know, I had read John Muir before I, I started to do the movie, you know, so in many ways I feel then the film now is on, uh, has more resonance for uh, an average audience because it really show you that everything you have there, many of things have disappeared. And I can tell you then all the sound have disappeared. Because for instance, I don't know if you know at the end, I recorded many of the sound, I am no sound person. So I did the recording or I gave a uh, sound recording to my brother who I could train to do things because he was very handy uh, and so on. And uh, uh, so I recorded in Yosemite sound of fog. There's no more fog in Yosemite. Okay. Uh, why? Because there's less water and fog needs water. And because there's too much, I don't know, uh, pollutant in the air. Yeah. So definitely uh, things, uh, the, 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 and San Diego County, which is huge, uh, and which has an enormous diversity of insect, animal, and so on, uh, you know, I've lost many species in the last, uh, since I have been there, since, uh, you know, the first time spring uh, 79, which is 40, more than 40 years ago, you know. So uh, I definitely think the spoliation of the earth is well on the way, and I find that very, very tragic. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy that my film make the case for that. Uh, and I actually am working on, uh, I finish uh, the, uh, now an installation which is called Eloge du Ver. It was first presented in Mo Montreal, which is a French, uh, it's in Quebec, it's in Canada. And therefore the title is French. Eloge du Ver means uh, homage to the color green. And when I first discovered that in Normandy, going every year to visit a friend of mine from film school, which I know therefore for 55 years, and his meadow in Normandy was suddenly brown, you know, in 2004, because there was a heat wave. I could not believe it. I said, if Normandy does not have any green anymore, I have a subject, you know, so I'm going to start to shoot photograph. And 10 years later, I made those photographs in a room and uh, I reinstalled that room with other, other photographs, with the fire of uh, the Malibu Canyon fire of last year. Uh, you know, plus things I shot, therefore, since I first installed in 2013, because I feel the subject of, you know, keeping track of what is there and what's going to disappear, which is what originally I had behind the idea of shooting this current location, is still very much a necessity for somebody like me. 
because I think indeed uh, there is less green now around. And in, in San Diego, around my backyard, you know, I mean, nobody has, a, has a, everybody has, a, you know, desert plant uh, for landscaping in front of their house. Or they have nothing. They have gravel, you know, and they park their car there. You know, it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible. It's better because they don't waste water, you know. But, uh, and actually, there are desert plants which are beautiful to look at, but it's a little bit uh, dry in a way. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I really feel things are changing for the worse, yeah. But there is more consciousness of that, so that's a good, uh, the young people are much more concerned. And uh, when I was young, I was concerned, but I think I, I, I did not feel I was necessarily the only person. But I definitely did not see much people around me being uh, interested in matter of ecology and conservation. Yeah, but now it's much more prevalent, so at least that's good. Maybe it's the reason why I'm not going to leave no, nothing to our grandchildren, you know. Oh, okay. S sorry, we are out of time. Thank oh, I'm really There's sorry. one more question? No? Do I have one more? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. One more. Okay. Thank you. I mean, as we were just discussing, you said there was this concern of ecology present in this film that seemed to predict, you know, a lot of the concerns that people are very focused on right now. You mentioned, oh, if it heats up one degree, all these terrible things will happen, um, which, you know, has been more present on people's minds. How did you craft the narrative for this movie? Um, did you well, write I mean, it? You know, I, I came to New York and discovered something really wonderful, uh, which is improvisation. So I craft, you know, I was sitting at a flatbed, uh, at a steam back, and I was saying what could be said here, and I, uh, I was ad-libbing and, uh, you know, using pen and pencil and uh, putting it on notepad and trying out. And uh, I did not try out really by recording, uh, uh, but I, I in many ways uh, uh, wrote it, put it on, I had a typewriter, put it on a typewriter, and at some point was reading it and I knew there will be another voice reading it, but I kind of was playing the visual to see if it was working. So it, it was totally written at the editing table. And if I could not find something interesting to say about it, or if just looking at it with nothing else, I don't have to speak when there's a storm, you know. And I did not add the, 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 the lighting, you know, it was there, it was miraculous, then I got it on my camera because I, I will not have had the money to put it because that was something you could do in Hollywood, something, uh, the 20s, you could do that, you know? And I knew even how to do it, but I did not have the money. So, uh, so in many ways, a lot of the sounds, some of it I, I, I I, uh, I got after the fact, like the storm and so on. Uh, but I also bought a collection of bird call and learned a lot about insect and, and bird and when do they sing and when I could use them and which landscape. So I'm sure I made ever, but I did my best to not do things which are, you know, totally out of the realism of the situation. Uh, so the, the, the sound was actually very important. It's not just the voice, it's also the, the ambient sound, which had to be totally created after the fact. So that took a very long time, actually. I spent more than a year and a half editing the movie. Yeah. Babette Mangold, thank you so much.